Well, welcome. I'm Eric Keplinger, Chief Preparator and Operations Manager at Mocha GA. Welcome to tonight's artist talk featuring Mocha GA's 2019-2020 Working Artist Project Fellow, Courtney McClellan. The Mocha GA Working Artist Project is an awards program to support established visual artists of merit who reside in the metropolitan Atlanta area. This initiative provides an unparalleled level of support for individual artists, expands the museum's mission, and promotes Atlanta as a city where artists can live, work, and thrive. Mocha GA's Working Artist Project Program is generously supported by the Charles Lordens Foundation, the Antonori Foundation, and the AEC Trust with additional support from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, this year's round of Working Artist Project Fellows was selected by Wesson Alkindary, currently the chief curator at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. Courtney McClellan's Working Artist Project exhibition is titled Simulations. Atlanta Georgia artist Courtney McClellan is both a visual artist and writer. Originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, she earned her BA in studio art and journalism and mass communications from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2008 and her MFA from Tufts University and the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. In 2013-14, Courtney was the Fountainhead Fellow in the Sculpture and Extended Media Departments at Virginia Commonwealth University and from 2015 to 2017, she was a Sculpture Fellow at the University of Georgia. She was a 2017 and 2018 Museum of Fine Arts Boston Traveling Fellow and has been an artist in residence at the Handage Center, uh, Wasaic Projects, and Yado. And her work <clears throat> was included in Sculpture Center's 2018 exhibition, In Practice, Another Echo. She was awarded the 2019-2020 Roman J. Witt Residency at the University of Michigan, where she created Witness Lab and introduced interdisciplinary collaborative project with the Stamp School of Art students and faculty, which culminated in an exhibition at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Courtney was recently named 2021 Innovator in Residence for the Library of Congress. I'm now going to turn this over to Courtney. Please feel free to type questions, comments in the chat box at any time, and Courtney will be happy to address them at the end of her talk. And now, without further ado, big applause for Courtney McClellan. All right. Um, so, so it's sort of, I first off wanted to start off, and sometimes when I, I'm making my work, to let people know that I am, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I know that's sort of a funny place to start, but I think because so much of my work starts and surrounds the idea of the relationship between performance and law that sometimes people assume I am. Um, but in fact, I, I grew up around lawyers. My father is a criminal defense attorney um, who's still practicing in Greensboro, North Carolina. And he started out as a public defender and still mostly does appointed cases. Um, and then my mother is a public school teacher who's now retired. And I think her work uh, shows up in this work just as much as my father's does. So sort of reflecting on my parents' work um, is, is sort of a regular part of my practice. A little bit of background about me and my education. Um, as Eric mentioned, as an undergraduate at UNC, I studied uh, studio art, but I also studied journalism. And, and so while I'm not a practicing journalist, like I'm not a lawyer, um, I do still think that my journalism tactics play into the work. So something I'm regularly doing as I'm making art is starting off with um, some of those kind of old journalism skills of interviewing and observing. Um, so that's sort of how I initiate many aspects of my project. I also want to say that for me, art making is something that is about inquiry. Um, so often rather than starting off on a project where I know how it's going to end up, it's me starting off with a question or idea, or more often than not, something that I'm really curious about that I don't understand. Um, so it's sort of me jumping off into a space where I get to learn something new. Um, because of that, I really let my research guide the outcome of the work. So by that, I mean that I don't always, I'm not necessarily a a uh, person who makes only sculpture or only photography or strictly installation, but instead that the work itself sort of guides where my practice goes. So I sort of let it kind of tell me what it needs to be over time. Um, and that can often be a slow process um, because I don't exactly know where it's going to end up. I'm always sort of discovering and trying out new things and, and new experiences. Um, 
something that I've sort of think I've benefited from and grown in my own practice the last few years is specificity. And sometimes uh, it seems like an odd topic to start with, but sometimes being really specific about the work that I'm studying has really helped me follow up on ideas that I'm excited about. So in, in the case of um, being a non-lawyer studying law, are studying the relationship between performance and law specificity sort of helps guided me to uh, thinking about legal simulation. Um, and legal simulation is a term that I'll use pretty often in this talk. And by that, I'm defining legal simulation as a thought experiment intended to train students in legal rules and procedure. So mock trial, for instance, one of the places I'll start focuses on litigation and court. The idea of uh, legal education or in performance, but in my case, I'm sort of bridging the two. Um, another kind of important thought that sort of uh, rattles around in my head as I'm making work is thinking about what Robert Blackson, who's a curator, said about simulation, which is simulation is practice that leads to theory. Um, and as somebody who's also an educator myself, this is a really powerful thought because rather than creating a theory and then acting it out through practice, it's that doing helps define what we think it should be. So through the act of um, performing, students learn and kind of make a theory about the way that the law should function. And so that's really kind of fascinating, kind of jumping off point for me about this relationship between performance and law. So the topic of legal simulation came up in my work about six years ago. Um, and so I've still been studying it. I've been excited about it as I've been making work so it's no less kind of relevant for me six years later um, and I continue to have questions about it. Uh, I specifically, it was sort of when I moved in 2015 to Athens, Georgia uh, and I was teaching at the University of Georgia and had long kind of thought about mock trial, known some people who had participated in it but really wanted to kind of follow up on what this idea was. And so I started, I communicated with the undergraduate mock trial team um, who was a part of the American Mock Trial Association which has about 350 teams who participate nationally. And I started observing them. And this kind of kicked off a three year observation period. And in that time period, I didn't make a lot of work about this. I would kind of test out ideas, but it was really a space for me to go back and be strictly an observer, strictly a witness, strictly a person who was there to kind of watch and learn. Um, and it was fascinating immediately. Um, the students practice regularly. They met in the journalism building five nights a week. They uh, refined their arguments, they tested out ideas, and I really saw it as a fascinating space where students played both witness and lawyer and shaped all aspects of the story they tell. Um, they alternated between criminal and civil cases, and immediately it drew up ideas for me about how this connected with other kinds of performance, like live action role play or LARPing or even other games people participate in like Dungeons and Dragons where you play a character. And so in this way, students were both playing a character as much when they were playing lawyer as, were, as they were when they were playing witness. Um, I also started to connect these ideas to other practices of world building. So putting it in the context of something like um, science fiction. Uh, and so I really just attended these things. I went to scrimmages, I went to tournaments, I even went to the mock trial national championship, which was in Greenville, South Carolina that year and observed and became fascinated that one case could play out hundreds, if not thousands of different ways. Um, so after really observing over a long time, I, I decided I did start making work about this. And I focused on the topic of Midlands, which was the fictional land that all mock trial cases were set inside of. Um, and I really wanted to try and visualize this fictional space that all these um, players and performers and potentially future lawyers were participating in. Um, so right now we're looking at an image. Um, the first place I showed Midlands was at Sculpture Center in Long Island City. Um, and this was sort of a one, what ultimately became a three channel video, but this was the first video of that. And the big question of course came up was how does this fictional world mirror the real justice system? And this um, comes again and again, as I'm uh, looking at the work and we'll talk about that in simulations too, how does this um, compare? And as I mentioned, this was sort of, it, it continued to grow. I also made this work that became a three channel video that I showed at the University of Georgia, um, which was interesting and exciting because of course those were the students that I was engaging and that I was uh, talking to. 
and I got to deal with all these kind of dichotomies of what Midlands was. So Midlands followed federal law, but yet it was this kind of alternative state. Um, Midlands didn't define the race, gender, or ethnicity of in the, any of the characters, but of course we know that's different than the actual practice of law. So again, this kind of constant bumping up against how, how was this real and where did the reality begin and end? So I wanted to kind of move on from, in, you know, in the kind of thinking about time, because um, I, I could talk about Midlands for, Midlands for a long time, of, about Witness Lab, which was the kind of follow-up project to this work. Um, and in the case of Witness Lab, uh, I was named the WIT artist in residence at the University of Michigan, which was really exciting to me because it gave me access to, again, a group of people who were um, engaging with and learning how to do something. They were kind of building a sense of knowledge. And so at the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan Museum of Art in the lower level, there, there was a gallery that had two glass walls and allowed people to kind of see inside as well as walk inside. And so we created a courtroom set in which we hosted legal performances. And we, we really hosted a range of events that included everything from um, courtroom scenes from Shakespeare, which you can see here, uh, the community high school mock trial team pr practiced and scrimmaged in the space, and we also hosted L1 oral arguments. Um, unfortunately, Whit Midlands, or unfortunately, Witness Lab was uh, cut short due to the pandemic. So we had one great month of Witness Lab, and then we had to close it. Um, but even in that time period, I learned a great deal from the people who were engaging in the space. And we also sort of, again, looked at that stretching definition of performance in law. So everything from future law students and mock trial kind of all the way to um, theatrical spaces where uh, courtroom scenes are staged. And this is sort of an installation image of Witness Lab. Um, sort of a slight divergence. I wanted to mention a couple of photographic influences as I start to talk about simulation. So this is not my image. This is a work by Martha Rossler, who I can, th can think of as a feminist performance artist, but who also makes many photographs. And in thinking about simulations, I just wanted to give a little bit of context about why these became images. Um, as I mentioned, the previous projects were video and performance, and this really um, necessitated to become images for several different reasons. But in doing so, because I, I don't regularly make photographs, I really um, became an avid consumer of a few different people's work. And so this is a series that Martha Rossler's made for many years in which she photographed airports. So it's just this regular documentation of a familiar space and sort of articulating how unfamiliar it actually is, how kind of um, uh, futuristic or um, kind of odd that these non-spaces are of airports. So this was one artist that I looked at a lot. Another artist is David Hart, um, who, this is from the Belvedere series, but this is a series of images of uh, like a public policy building and what it actually sort of looks like inside. So again, taking a space that we may interact with or have some kind of uh, over familiarity with and then realizing how kind of strange the space actually is. Something else you'll notice about the three artists they chose is that there aren't any people in the images, which is sort of a common theme that shows up in simulations as well. And this is Hiroshi Shujimoto, who makes photographs of, um, this is from the theater series. And again, it's a, a photograph of an empty theater, but part of what happens here is he photographs um, a long exposure, allowing an entire movie to play in the scene. So of course, sort of encapsulating this whole kind of performance space and the audience space and what happens on the screen in one singular image. Um, so we're, we're now to simulation. So this is the exhibition that I currently have up at MOCA GA. Um, and this project started really in uh, summer of 2019, right around when I was uh, given this fellowship. Um, I had been interested for a while because I had um, seen enough mock trials and talked to enough students and even interviewed a few law students, I started to realize that many law schools had these performance spaces or these practice law, law courtrooms inside of them. And I became really fascinated. At first, I just went to the one at UGA and thought it was the only one and then quickly realized that it's um, common. In fact, there's very few law schools I found that don't have them at this point. Um, and you kind of can relate this a little bit to the growing 
um, interest in, in law school, not just being an intellectual exercise, but a training for a field. So I think there's a kind of drive to train people um, to be lawyers and these spaces are a part of that. Uh, the first one I went to was the one on the right, which was at UGA, which was Red Velvet and partially became part of the Midlands video. Um, but it was Red Velvet, very theatrical, uh, almost ecclesiastical. Um, it had portraits on the wall and, and um, you know, really kind of pushed to, towards that theater space. Whereas as I went to other ones, they looked kind of more institutional. So in, in thinking about this project, um, I, I decided to start going to see more of these spaces. And in some ways the photo photography became secondary because I just really wanted entrance in to see what these spaces look like. And it was much stranger for me to just ask to see them. Um, so I started communicating with PR offices at law schools and asking if I could come in and, and document them. And I didn't really know what I was going to find. Like I said, I had only been in one other uh, like performance courtroom. And so went in this kind of um, exploration to see what these spots were. And a lot of, many times this was something I was doing, um, not making a special trip, but like on my drive home to see my parents in North Carolina, or as I was going to visit a friend, I would um, try to stop and document one of these. And ultimately it became important because uh, of course making these images right now wouldn't be possible. Um, so I, I made these photographs really from summer of 2019 into um, I guess, yeah, into fall, um, and then was gone to, to work on this project, doing this project in, um, uh, to make Witness Lab, and then have returned, but it's given me so much time to process these images, and ultimately, there are probably close to 50 of them in the American South, but I've probably photographed about 15, so there's many more that I look forward to doing. Um, something I want to off the bat address, which is the kind of the way that it's installed. Um, I wanted to kind of remind viewers that this is not quite reality. Um, so kind of using this uh, almost reality space, I wanted to kind of double down on some of the architectural details in the actual photographs and kind of pull them out of that space so that it felt sort of um, homogenized and uh, formal in the way that some of these courtrooms look while still kind of being little portals into individual spaces as you look at them. Um, I also use their a very light blue and I regularly use the kind of uh, icy blue uh, in my work to kind of signal again this not quite reality this kind of simulation space or this uh, it's a color palette you typically wouldn't find in a courtroom so all the architectural details are of that space the indicators are not uh, with the color. And something else that I think was important in thinking about these spaces was that um, they, they, in many ways, and we'll talk about this a few more instances, blur the reality and the fiction of, or the practice or the simulation of the space. Um, so for instance, many of these spaces actually do have appellate cases adjudicated in them at times. So many, in many states, uh, appellate courts will travel around and adjudicate cases in different spaces. So for instance, some of these spaces host um, appellate cases temporarily while they sort of act as a classroom or courtroom in day-to-day -day life for the students. And this is another kind of install image to see what this looks like. Um, another kind of regular question I've gotten about this project is um, why these simulated spaces rather than an actual courtroom. Um, and this, the answers are for a few different reasons. Um, one is that actually photographing a courtroom is really difficult. Um, I've done it one time getting the permission to actually do that is a, is a challenge. Um, and when the one time I did it involved the clerk standing next to me while I photographed for 15 minutes and then was escorted out. Um, but the other kind of more, more kind of true response is that I think these spaces are curious because they speak to something about the future. The people who are practicing in them are going to go on and be future lawyers. So there's something about the description of the space that they're actively learning inside of that might tell us something about how law might be adjudicated in the future or how um, the legal system may 
may function or, or not function. So I think there's something important in kind of taking a critical eye to these practice spaces. Um, and overall, I think a theme that you'll see in all these images as I go through them is this kind of interwoven architecture of the idea of training and performance and power. So that's sort of something that kind of comes up again and again. Uh, this first image that we're looking at, it shows a camera and that was one of the first things that I really noticed that distinguished these spaces from actual courtrooms. And it's not because cameras don't exist in courtrooms. There are surveillance cameras in many courtrooms, but instead that the camera still holds a contentious um, kind of space inside a courtroom. I think it's one of the last places in my mind that in, in America that you're really not allowed to bring a camera on your own. Um, so even like a camera phone has to often be checked at the door and video recording in courtrooms sometimes happens and we can see, you know, some, some court cases that we've seen uh, on TV or some other space, but more often than not, um, the camera still holds some power. And I think what's interesting about these spaces and these cameras is that rather than being about surveillance necessarily, I think they're again an object of performance. So people who might document the space then go back and look at the footage of how their oral argument went or how they uh, performed under those circumstances. So, so this is one of those images. Um, this is another one that's, these were, and this in the case of American University, they had two courtrooms. So the first one was sort of the office space. And then this one actually was a former church that was turned into a courtroom. Um, so you can see the kind of dramatic architecture and the edges and also that mounted camera. Similar to a camera, another thing that you I regularly spotted and sort of connected between all these spaces was screens. Um, screens are regularly utilized in classrooms and courtrooms now. Um, and so that's one of the spaces that we're kind of looking at. So they might be used to share a PowerPoint or play evidence. Um, sometimes they look like large projectors and other times they're mounted screens like this that can be moved around the room. Um, but there's sort of another kind of uh, figure that I spotted regularly in these empty spaces. Uh, portraits were really sort of interesting. I think um, I had a friend once say about these spaces that I love an empty room and that that is very true. But of course, what was inter interesting about these empty spaces that the, there were figures and then that the portraits were often kind of taking the place of the body. And I liked the emptiness of the room because I think it allowed um, for you not to focus on just the individuals who were maybe performing in the moment, like the photographs from Witness Lab, which were really about those individuals practicing, but instead allowed you to project into the space potentially, or allowed you to imagine the hundreds or thousands of people who might be um, learning inside of that space. The other sort of interesting thing about the portraits is they were um, almost or they were predominantly white men who were depicted in the portraits and they were predominantly paintings. Um, so this would be an image where you can really see that collision of uh, the courtroom space and the classroom space and then this kind of drop ceiling, this kind of institutional space. And I will say that that all that they were predominantly white men and most of them excluding uh, North Carolina Central, which is the HBCU in Durham, North Carolina. And they both had women and people of color depicted, but they were also photographs, which I found really fascinating. And this is also uh, North Carolina Central. Um, another thing that you can sort of see here that kind of repeats in some of the images is about seating. Um, so regularly, the seating range from, again, that red velvet that I showed earlier to uh, sometimes it's pews. So again, thinking about that church context that it relates to, sometimes it's sort of stadium seating like this, so multiple people could sit. And sometimes it looks like movie theater chairs, or in this case, these kind of fold over um, desk chairs. And that always sort of made me, again, recall the people who are sitting there, which are students sort of learning. And these were the chairs at the University of Alabama. Um, and something else I sort of found interesting just in visiting some of the places were really pristine and super organized and some of them felt like, you know, classrooms where people had left notes and old papers or old presentation 
um, materials there or were, you know, staged in like small groups. So every time I would go into new ones, so they were sort of had a different arrangement, even though the structure itself was very the same, very much the same. And similar to the photo, the, the camera and, and to these chairs, it made me think so much about looking. There were so many kind of points of hierarchy, both in the physical way that, you know, the judge was often at the center of the room and kind of faced kind of um, looking out at people and the chairs in the back were kind of lower potentially or again in like stadium seating like a like a large scale movie theater. Um, but there were so many different types of looking and that there, everybody really had to be visible. So the witness had to be able to look in physical space out to where the uh, you know, lawyers tables are the people in the audience would have to be able to see the judge. Um, so despite the fact that there were no actual figures populating these spaces, I became intensely aware of all the kinds of looking that were going on. And this is at the University of Georgia, like I said, and this was the first one of these spaces I saw. And this was one, this is at Georgia State. Um, and this one felt like the most like a kind of typical classroom, although the difference being some of the kind of way the microphones are st staged, the um, kind of uh, curved theater setting, and then also that typically there was more than one chair at the front. So again, that would be staged for like an appellate court. Um, another theme that came up regularly was microphones. And I've used microphones in other parts of my work before, but inevitably they kind of recall who's speaking into them and why and and kind of staging again a space for for voice or speech or um, the possibility but not the requirement for conversation and so where the microphone was said a lot about power structures to me as well and this is another microphone at duke university And then, you know, one of the last things I thought I would mention was some of the architectural details were which really were potent. Um, regularly in a lot of these spaces, I saw things that I was familiar with that you might see in um, other kind of positions of power, banks, government buildings of any kind, um, columns were common. This was particularly, this was an oratory dome at the University of Georgia so that it was in theory allowed you not to have to speak at a microphone that everyone in the space could hear you. So it served as kind of ornate architecture and at the same time was supposed to allow for vocal projection. Um, but as you can see in the background, it, it's also this kind of interesting combination of uh, like institutional, um, you know, uh, air conditioning systems and spaces as well as like architectural details about power, about um, things that are regularly used in to sig signify democracy, but also kind of authority. This was one of my favorite ones. This is at Samford University in Birmingham. And you could just really see like the idea that these two columns like unevenly run into each other um, and they meet this kind of wainscoting at the base and yet this very like institutional carpet. Um, so that was another thing, this kind of constant collision of institutional meeting formal um, space that, that I think is uh, we're used to in schools or in some way, but the kind of uh, dramatic flair is what makes it unusual. And this is at the University of Alabama as well, which had a lot of uh, paneling and unusual kind of curves inside the space. But again, here you see this really ornate clock and this uh, carpet that you would see in any school. Um, so all of these kind of structures really were powerful. And the other thing that I'll say that I kept on noticing was a lot of anachronism of things from different time periods kind of running in together. So in this case, the paneling seems from a different time period than the plugs, than the carpet. Um, so this constant kind of butting up against one another of uh, time periods and ideas, um, and yet kind of uh, awkwardly coexisting inside the space. And I can say that, you know, when, you know, I've been thrilled to have this opportunity to put this work together and be able to show it under these circumstances. And what's, it's still exciting to me, which I think is a good sign. I think that I'll probably um, continue to make these photographs as time goes on and again, as kind of things open up. Um, 
but that these still, I still kind of get excited going into these spaces to document and see what's there. And there's always sort of new um, curious things to find, new suggestions about um, legal education and culture. And so I, I, I want to go back. I want to do more. So I think um, there's, there's more images to make out there and, and that feels um, exciting to me. So with that, I'm, I have time for questions if we have them. Question is from Catherine uh, Chastain, and they asked, uh, "Would you be able to say a little bit about the choice to not include people, and thus the play out of the legal performance in your photographs for this specific exhibition?" Sure. Um, so I think there, yeah, there's several reasons why. Um, so in past work. Uh, I have included individual people. Like I said, you can see Witness Lab, which was really documenting individual and kind of stretching the conversation we were having about uh, legal performance. In these cases, um, I, I can give kind of two, two distinct answers. One, which is um, I didn't know what these images were going to be when I first made them. I sort of walked into the space and found so much curiosity in simply the architecture in the, again, these suggestions of democracy and power in um, kind of uh, the arrangement of the space that still spoke to those kind of topics that I was interested in. And then secondly, I think there's something curious and important about thinking about how this is a stage that people are still engaging in. So this is being about not the education of one individual, but instead how does this space educate thousands of people who will go on to practice law or go on to some other field or work in the legal profession in some way. And so the kind of, I think there were already so many interesting cues in to just simply how the spaces were laid out that, um, that I, I didn't need the people to kind of specify it in that way. There were already so many um, unusual specifics to engage with here. All right, so we have another question. Um, Courtney, how has the pandemic affected your work over the past year? What were you planning and what might you not have been able to do or the changes you have made in the middle of your project due to the shutdown? Or how has the pandemic affected these spaces? Sure, okay, so let me see, I'll, I'll do my best and you guys can tell me if I'm, if I'm missing a <laughs> question in there. Um, so I think, uh, the making art in the pandemic is, is challenging. I think any artist, and I know there's many of them here, um, could speak to that. I think uh, partially when I can kind of, when lockdown happened, I was in Michigan having had done a month of, of Witness Lab. And at that point we had sort of planned everything out. So we had another, you know, eight weeks of performances planned. So there was some uh, grieving about the fact that we didn't get to see some of those amazing events, which were going to be really cool. And so um, I, I feel grateful that I got the month that I was there with the students and the faculty. And then also, of course, sad that we didn't get to uh, finish that out, including that there was supposed to be a book tied with Witness Lab. So unfortunately, we didn't get to make the book in the end. Um, so that's sort of one question about how that's changed. I mean, this project has evolved um, a great deal, uh, you know, despite the fact I was already making these images and as I said, not really sure where they were going to go, but, you know, I had plans to engage another team or work with somebody local and, of course, nobody could have predicted the school year that we've had. Um, but I am really grateful that it's given me a chance to focus on these images because I think they were already doing a lot of the things I was interested in. They were already kind of teasing out some of the ideas that I was really curious about. And, and they allowed for uh, this kind of photo installation space that I think still speaks to this kind of staging or performance space, even in the way that it's installed. Um, and then the last question, if I'm remembering it right, was about how these spaces are affected during the pandemic. Um, I don't know about you all, I can say that uh, some of the teaching I'm doing right now is mostly online. Uh, people who I know who are in law school are mostly online. Um, so these are sort of empty spaces. Um, and not only are these simulation spaces empty, but I don't know if you all know any people who are practicing lawyers, but uh, many of those spaces are closed as well. So it's sort of, depending on what kind of law you practice, it may be delayed. Um, I can speak to my own, my 
uh, my dad still ends up going into court sometimes, but they've made all these glass boxes for everybody to stand into, which really talk about another kind of like architectural element. Um, so some cases are still being heard, but many aren't. So from an educational standpoint, all this kind of live performance work uh, isn't, isn't happening. And I'm sure there's like, we're all kind of experiencing the loss of that. Do you find some humor in these photographs in the way that they're installed? I see their frames matching the wainscoting. Wainscoting? Yes. <laughs> um, so I do, I think that I'm really interested in the idea of like doubling down on something. So to, to show how, I mean, I think back to that Martha Rossler image that I, you saw of like the artificial tree meeting the artificial light and it's so many artificial things stacked on top of each other that they become strange. And so in this case, I think that there's like revealing these um, architectural motifs that we take for granted that again are supposed to remind us that this is formal, that this is public, that this is potentially powerful um, uh, and kind of reusing those is a way to kind of recall the strangeness of it. There's also something about like kind of creating a life-size version of a model house that I was thinking about the kind of like pristineness and oddity of everything being the same color. Okay, cool. So next question is, could I ask you to elaborate more on the idea of a future that is signaled or laid in in the spaces and how you feel it comes across in form or tone? Sure. Um, so, I mean, that was sort of one of the things that I thought a lot about in this work that that the idea of the future was um, in some ways more apparent in, in Midlands, but I think still lives in this work. And it's in a couple of ways. Um, one, I think the anachronism, the kind of mixing of time periods, it can only happen in this kind of forward looking time. So the wainscoting meeting the crown molding or meeting the column meeting the institutional carpet like that that actually that's not like creating a replica of something from a modernist replica that's a very contemporary um, visual space and something that, that I think is forward looking um, and I also think there's something inherent just about who's there so uh, something I think a lot about when I talk about simulation is um, the science fiction and, and Ursula Le Guin who's a science fiction writer says that uh, science fiction is not predictive it's descriptive and so there's something about in these images, I just wanted to describe what is there, that that was enough to tell us something about the kind of fictional space or about the future, because the people who are in there are actually the future, right? Like we're talking about physical space and structures, but in reality, it's the people who engage that space that are going to set the tone for the future, you know, the future of the legal world. And so the, the kind of shell or the casing or the architecture of the space is just sort of holding on to some information while it's the people who aren't, who we can't see, but we know are there that are actually sort of the future looking part of the project. Great. So the next question says, uh, I know you mentioned that the simulations are feature oriented, but do you think it's also possible to have an aesthetic weight and mannered emptiness as in Thomas Demand or Eugene Atget or even Wilhelm Hammershoy. Can you read the first part of the question again? Sure. Uh, I know you mentioned that simulations are feature oriented, but do you think it's also possible to have aesthetic weight and mannered emptiness? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, I, you saw the three images that I looked at that we looked at that weren't about simulation that are still about empty spaces. So I think that that's really um, curious and, and I'm sure it's part of an aesthetic drive for me is not, you know, in addition to what I think it does for the, for the project. Um, and even I think, you know, I thought a little bit about installing this show because I knew that people who are gonna be in there were gonna be by themselves or with one or two other people. And so there was something interesting again about empty space on top of empty space, installation space that was empty, meeting photographs that were also empty. Um, so I think there's an absolute weight and power and kind of emptiness. Um, and that some of that can relate to this kind of simulation question. And some of it is just inherent in uh, the photographs, but maybe in, in kind of life right now. <laughs> 
Great. So the next question says, um, can you discuss the works that are placed in the oblong? It has a kind of Renaissance vibe as, it, as if these items, say a microphone, are some kind of relic. So I think if, if I'm understanding correctly, we're talking about, well, there's two like oval frames that were used in the image. And I think those two sort of stood alone to me. Um, the, so the two things that I'm making sure I understand this question correctly, so I'll just answer them both and see if, see if we get there. Um, one of them being that I thought of like creating this, the oval frames were creating like a, a portrait, essentially like I think about ovals being portraiture. Um, one of them has a painting that sort of, uh, so it is sort of like, again, a, a portrait on top of a portrait that also includes some of the drop ceiling in it. So there is something kind of um, painterly about, about that. And then the other one is that empty microphone that has all these um, shadows and reflection of the microphone in front of it so that it's one microphone, but you see you know, eight different microphone shadows. And so I thought about how much microphones sort of stage up one person, one person speaking and one person allowing one person to speak to many people. Um, and that's one of those other kind of inherent things to, to performance in many ways, but also to, uh, to the courtroom of like bestowing one person with the ability to speak to everyone under those circumstances. I'm hoping that I got there. If she didn't just uh, rephrase the question <laughs> yeah. in the chat box, then we can, we can figure it out. But uh, the next question, um, I'm curious about your uh, about how your research has perhaps uh, dovetailed with the performance of the clinic slash performance of the medical pedagogy. Right. So I mean that there actually is a lot of overlap. So one of the things um, that I learned while I was at the University of Michigan was sort of about like clinical law that very much is the same as like clinical, like being a diagnostician um, as a medical professional and that people are being trained. Like there's a clinical law professor now, which is really something that's only been going on for like the last 20 years. So of the hundreds of years of legal education, the idea that you need to be trained, a trained clinician or somebody who's good at interacting with people in the kind of very um, straightforward uh, human and non uh, analysis oriented part of law um, and somebody can correct me on that if that's not how they see it but that that that's valued now and I don't think you know people who went to law school 50 years ago they weren't engaging or 30 years ago um, with the idea of being like a clinically a clinical or a clinically trained lawyer um, so I, I, I would suspect that's one case why I, I would say there's been a like proliferation of these kind of courtroom spaces um, because I don't think they were always part of law schools. I think you would probably go to a law school 30 years ago and you wouldn't see one of these performance courtrooms. Great. All right. So our next question is, um, let me make sure it's the right one. The physical space of a mock trial courtrooms and the idea of Midlands brings back to mind the concept of liminality. Were you thinking about that when making these photographs? They also carry an inherent uncanny quality in their emptiness and clash of overlapping design from decades of use. Yeah, so I would say two things. I mean, I think um, I'm certainly think about liminal spaces. I often think I heard an artist, uh, Talbot Altenbacher, speak one time and she said that there's like the sand and the ocean and the artists are interested in the foam. And so there's some part of that kind of in-between space being often what people are interested in. Um, I think there's, and the uncanny question, I think there is some potential trickery here where, or some assumption that if you, uh, you might assume that it is a, a real courtroom. And again, in a weird way, these are real courtrooms, like people who are practicing in them will go on to be lawyers, people who are in an appellate case will be, uh, you know, having a case adjudicated in those spaces. So there's just this really, the curiosity of like where reality and fiction uh, meet and often overlap um, is really what's curious to me. Like people in the space are pretending to be their future self. Um, and that, that's such a curious, I and mean, we've all experienced that, right? We all know what that feels like. So 
how to how that manifests in the physical space is sort of what I'm fundamentally interested in. Awesome. All right. So the next question says, um, I'm thinking so much about how the public's understanding or perception of what happens in the courtroom is both shaped by and shapes portrayal in media like true crime and courtroom dramas. Is there some crazy performative feedback loop going on that we should interrupt or is, or is that your work or that your work might attempt to interrupt? So yes, that's certainly something I'm interested in and probably a, another kind of facet for this work. Um, there is something called the CSI effect, which is studied by lawyers and performance uh, theorists. So there's sort of the, they're the meeting of, of everybody I'm sort of curious about. Um, but the CSI effect sort of says that people go into cases, um, like if you're a juror going into a case that you expect the law or expect a case to play out sort of like an episode of CSI, um, that, that many people sort of think it's going to be a tight argument, there's going to be an aha moment, there's going to be a big reveal where we learn that it's he did it or she did it or whatever, and that there's going to be this kind of obvious outcome. And the reality is that it's not like that at all. Um, so I think an overall goal or like, what do I hope people take away from is like a critical eye on these spaces. It's sort of that there is some um, hopefully enjoyment in this case of, of finding the unreality in the space and that if maybe if you take that critical eye with you uh, as a juror in the future um, that 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 might kind of uh, help us reorient ourselves to something to to uh, to the judicial system. Sweet. All right. The next question is Biden just rebuked the Trump executive order on classical architecture order. You are investigating sociopolitical space. When ex when ex oh sorry when exhibited outside an educational institution, how do you consider the visitor experience or interpretation as your investigation and work re reveals relevant current topics? Okay, so I'm trying to make sure I understand the whole question, but um, I mean, I you think- You want me to reread it? Yeah, reread it, that's good. Okay. Biden just revoked the Trump executive order on classical architecture order. You are investigating the socio-political space when, when exhibited outside an educational institution. How do you consider the viewer, the visitor experience or interpretation as your investigation and work reveals relevant current topics? Sure. I mean, so there's a couple of things there. I mean, one of the tools in my tool chest here is this doubling. So to, sh to reveal the strangeness of the neoclassical architecture is to, to make it twice, to double it up, to kind of reveal that the space is artifice and structured and um, that it's signaling to you and using kind of visual culture to tell you something about the space. And it's up to you to decide whether that's what this telling you is, is true or not. Um, so I think that's one thing about, uh, you know, the, the use of classical, classical architecture and how you see that in spaces. And, and again, the kinds of spaces we see that in, like that we don't see columns in um, Greek keys in like preschools. You know, we see them in courtrooms and banks and government buildings. Um, and then the second part of like, how do you, I think it's sort of like, how do you conscientiously engage a viewer in a space? And some of that is by giving some information. I mean, in the case of this show, like I called it simulation. So that was already on the forefront of your mind that you were engaging with not quite reality when you were looking at them. Um, sometimes I also think that there's a really uh, great potential for reveal. Um, I like that moment when somebody looks at something, thinks it's one thing and then reads the title or reads the wall text or, um, and gets kind of another, another angle on something. I also think there's potential sort of like the doubling of the architecture, like accumulation is, is uh, effective, or I hope it is, that re repeating these things that you start to see them as um, something to be like uh, uncertain about, that all of these kind of architectural elements and to not take them for granted. All right, so our last question says, asks, uh, does your father, does your lawyer father ever have anything to say about your work? He does. Um, sometimes, 
Um, oftentimes I will, so I have a lawyer father and I also have a lawyer best friend. So I often feed questions to various, to, to my different audiences for different topics. Um, sometimes I regularly, I ask one or both of them, like, is this real? You know, sometimes again, not being a lawyer myself, like, do you do this in mock trial cases? Uh, have, have what kind of spaces have you been inside of? Um, and then some of it even is interesting between, between the two of like, what, what was your education like? Um, so in Julia's case, she's my age. And so, you know, like they went to law school 30 years apart. What was the difference there? How was the education experienced? Um, sometimes, and so I often, I will ask him those kinds of questions. Uh, my dad is a good critic. So he will also give me his feedback on things if he thinks that it's um, unrealistic or un uninteresting or uh, if if he, he kind of sees it from a different perspective. But I, I really value that because again, in making this work uh, and I'm, I'm kind of, uh, it's again, it's an inquiry. It's me trying to figure something out. So if I have, if I have someone that I can call and ask them about their experience inside of this, uh, it's, it's only helpful. And it's something I regularly do, you know, meeting friends, meeting people as if, you know, asking more questions. Um, and one of the things I often asked if I talk to practicing lawyers or law students is what, what do you want to get really good at? And the answer is almost always storytelling, which I find really interesting. Um, and so I think that this theme of storytelling will, will continue in my work for a little while. Well, Courtney, thanks. And with that, myself and Mocha J would like to thank you so much for what you've given tonight. And I'd also like to thank everyone who's shown up and listened in. This was incredible. And I hope you all have a wonderful night tonight. Congratulations, Courtney. And uh, we're signing off. Thank you all. Thanks thank for coming. you.